Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming out to Revit RVA. Uh, this is our June edition. Um, really appreciate your support in the group by your attendance and, and interest in the subjects that we talk about here. By the way, can I have a show of hands to those who are first time people here at Revit RVA? Welcome. Thank you for coming out. Um, we do this uh, here in Richmond to really, um, you know, spur in the community of people that are really interested in building information modeling, what this technology does and how it can affect their businesses. And CAD Microsystems, my company supports this. I'm Jeff Graver with CAD Microsystems and we run four of these in the uh, Mid-Atlantic. We have uh, one in DC, one in Baltimore, one in Raleigh, uh, which we call Revit Triangle, and one here obviously in Richmond. And uh, there's a meeting every, uh, every month. We have two meetings in one of these locations. Uh, we've been live streaming this for the last, what, probably six months, and we're finally trying to get it down. So uh, if you can't make the meeting and you want to see them, then you can see them live. We're experimenting with this right now. We're also recording them. So if you go to YouTube and type in Revit RVA, Revit DC, you'll find recordings. And hopefully, if you saw something you liked tonight or saw something you wanted to reference to somebody else, then uh, maybe uh, you would go back and say, hey, go to 25 seconds in on the video, uh, and it would give you some type of point of reference. That's the idea. We're experimenting with this right now, uh, and so if it's of value to you, please let us know uh, by visiting, actually. Um, so this is what we're here to do. Uh, we have at RVA is we provide a forum, and forum so that we can all you know, share best practice and methods, but most importantly, to introduce you all to each other because you all the people that self-selected your people that are self-selected yourself as people that are interested in this technology and what it does. So really the, the connection is, is uh, very important to, to us and hopefully to you. And we also will be sending out a meeting survey at the end of the meeting. This is how we develop uh, uh, all the agendas that you see here tonight. Um, from these surveys, we'll ask you what you'd like to see in each one of these meetings. And this is how they're, they're developed. And it's uh, developed by the Board of Advisors that uh, guides this uh, group. The Board of Advisors are people that uh, um, are in the room. I, I forgot to put a slide up, put their all the names on, but we're, we're mostly here tonight. And uh, uh, what we do is we meet a lun at a lunch, over lunch uh, uh, one week after this meeting and go over all those surveys and then uh, choose what we're going to do for the next meeting and the meeting th after that. So it really comes from you what's relevant and, and what you'd like to see in these meetings. So tonight we have uh, two presentations. Uh, people, uh, w one is about Forge. Uh, we get asked about this from time to time. What is this forge thing? Why should I care? And Jason's here to give you some insight into this. So if you're using any one of Autodesk products, uh, you should understand what forge is because it is really going to be the basis for how you're going to be dealing in, in, in the new world. Um, and then we're going to hear from uh, somebody from Eagle Construction, Nathan Blinn, who uh, we just uh, were talking with about uh, his, what they were doing at Eagle Construction and his uh, 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 connections with the university environment and uh, he's going to present to us really how that's you know manifesting itself and in, in helping partners with industry so that we get what we need and, and academic is, is doing what what, uh, what they should do and, um, and then we'll have a little Q&A afterwards um, as always uh, when you come to these meetings they will start on time and they will end on time uh, it's our commitment to you so that you're uh, you know, can make plans. So with that, let's uh, start with, uh, we have Jason up here on what is Forge and why should you care? Jason? All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, thanks for joining us tonight, talking about Forge. My name is Jason Kunkel. I'm Senior Practice Manager over at CAD Microsystems, so I do consulting around um, Revit, around BIM. We do training standards. I do a little coding on the side, and honestly, it's not really coding as much as it's copying and pasting other people's code and then beating up until it works. So I imagine some of you are kind of on the same page with that as well. Uh, I'm going to give a disclaimer at the beginning of our presentation tonight. Um, I try to use this slide as often as I can, but we are dialing the nerd level up to 11 for this presentation. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again, you all chose to come to a software user group tonight. So this is partially on you. So just keep that as mind as we're going through some of this. <coughs> Real quick, as an outline, we're going to talk about APIs, kind of what they are at 30,000 feet, so we have a baseline uh, of what we're talking about. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Revit API, how it applies, what you can do with it, and then I want to dive into Forge. I want to break down um, what it is, the different components, and I want to talk just a little bit about what you can do with it or what you potentially will be able to do with it down the road. 
Now, a lot of this conversation is planting a seed. So like Jeff mentioned, this is the way Autodesk is going. So if you've used BIM 360, if you used anything on BIM 360, that is all built on Forge. And everything's going to the quote cloud. Uh, everything's gonna be you know, up in the internet. And um, what they are building and what they are setting up for Forge is, is how we are going to offer certain services and hopefully make our, our lives a little easier down the road. So from 30,000 feet, APIs. What is an API? API stands for Application Programming Interface. Uh, it is the tools and functions kind of behind the scenes that you can access software and get software to do what you want it to do. Um, it can be the middleman between two pieces of software as well. So when you're using Word, when you're using Revit directly with your mouse, you're going through the user interface. You're going through the UI. The API is essentially a back door into the software that lets other programmers use it. Not with mouse clicks, not on the monitor, but through calls, through rules, through methods that are exposed through the API. So if we're talking about the Revit API, it is made specifically for Revit. Um, <clears throat> it has not been around forever. I, I can't remember exactly what release it was, but when I started using Revit on version 2008, or it wasn't even 2008, version eight or version nine, back then there was like, we're never gonna have an API, it's never gonna be opened up. And then a couple of years later, there was an API. Um, so that allows people to build software that hooks into Revit, and there's a good chance you've used it. Uh, one of the nice things is any new feature that rolls out with Revit is typically inside the API. So I'm trying to think what were some new features. You know, the new 3D views. Um, I'm blanking on all my new features. A lot of MEP new stuff that, that came out recently. That's all in the API. It can all be accessed and tweaked uh, programmatically. Some of the older features, for some reason, have not been rolled into it. So one of the things that, that is really odd, for some reason, we cannot use the API to create ceilings. Floors are fine, walls are fine, roofs are fine, ceilings are not. We don't know why. It's not there. Hopefully someday it'll be in the API and we can programmatically uh, create some ceilings. Um, and obviously it's made for Revit. Now, <clears throat> what it does is it allows programmers to update Revit information inside of your model without using the user interface. The key here, you, you have to have Revit running to run a third-party application inside of Revit. So I can't write a program that accesses the Revit API outside of Revit. So what that also means is I have to own Revit. I have to buy a license of Revit for it to do things with my third-party program. There are tons of examples out there. We talk about Dynamo a lot here. Dynamo is kind of just a visual programming skin of the API that sits inside of Revit. So Dynamo can only do things that the API can do. So tomorrow, go see if you can add a ceiling through Dynamo. Not gonna be able to. Um, <clears throat> Autodesk itself, if there's functionality they want to use to enhance the software, they will often write an application through the API as opposed to putting it right into Revit on its own. Roombook is an example, Model Checker, the Kobe extension, uh, WorkShare Monitor technically is, a, is an add-in that accesses through the API as well. It's not in the core software, it is another piece of software that's built on top of there. Uh, here at CAD Microsystems, we build our own stuff. We got Filter Plus, just a little plug there for you. If you're not using Filter Plus, you're wasting your time. Um, Keynote Manager, I know a lot of folks use Keynote Manager. Uh, and if you're curious about kind of keeping up with it, there is a blog, revitaddons.blogspot.com. Just every week. I mean, there's like a dozen new Revit plugins every week that come out. Some do one tiny thing, some do 10,000 giant things. It just depends on the process that they need. Uh, but these were all developed by programmers through the Revit API. So in a nutshell, APIs let programmers work with other pieces of software. Revit has its own API, and then the Revit add-ins done through the API must run through Revit. So I'm building tools to make my life easier, but I've got to use Revit to run those tools. That's where Forge kind of comes in. So Forge itself, um, it is a series of web-based APIs. It's developed by Autodesk. So it is targeting their markets, it's targeting their files, it's targeting their workflows, and it's going to support their customers. Um, 
it is not reliant on BIM 360, but BIM 360, the current generation of BIM 360, relies on Forge. So I'm not going to get back into classic and all that kind of stuff, but any new thing that comes out on BIM 360 was written on top of Forge itself. So they're using their own APIs. They're eating their own dog food to make their own tools. These are the different components. So these are a series of nine different APIs. There's a little bit of overlap about what each does. I'm going to quickly touch on each one, and then we're going to spend a lot of time on, does the spotlight work? All right, spotlight doesn't work. Uh, design automation. So design automation is the fun one. That's the one that's kind of most directly applicable to a Revit uh, user group. Uh, the first one they've got is a token flex API. It's about enterprise, enterprise cloud credits. Does anybody have enterprise licensing? It's really boring, so we don't talk about it too much. Um, reality capture API. So if you're using Recap, you can write your own software that essentially does what Recap does. Autodesk has a SPOS functionality that allows you to do that heavy lifting, that heavy processing of generating 3D models from 2D images uh, through the reality capture API. There's a data management API, which is essentially just if you've got projects inside of BIM 360 and you need to rename folders, you need to move files around, that's what the file management API does. So essentially, if I've got a lot of projects inside of my BIM 360 projects and I hate the BIM 360 interface, I can write my own interface to move those files around. Uh, another example of this is we've seen um, instances folks will have a connector between their BIM 360 and Dropbox. So they want all their BIM 360 files copied over to Dropbox. They have used the file management API to grab all those files, copy them over. <coughs> Authentication, it's important, but it's boring. Um, it lets you log in. It tells you, you this person, you're allowed to access these files. This is important. Um, this is critical. Model derivative has a really cool name, but it's not very exciting, frankly. Um, this will convert some files to a couple other formats. So who's, uh, who has projects up on BIM 360? Who's accessed projects and files on BIM? You know when you click on the model and you get that interface in there, you get the right there? That is not the native Revit file. That is not the native STL. That has been translated with the model derivative app API to an SVS file, SVF file format. So that viewer is its own format, and model derivative is what takes your original file and puts it in that format. Now with that, I can write my own software that does it then. If I don't want to use their viewer, if I want to get an OBJ file, if I want to get an STL file out there, if I want to make some streamlined application that's going to take every single model, it's going to give me something I can 3D print, I can make a program that's going to utilize the model derivative, kind of the model transformation, and it'll spit out a file that allows me to do that. So we're rushing through some of the boring ones. Webhooks, Webhooks is actually kind of cool. It's a kind of a, a more recent one. Um, Folks have used if, this, then, that before. You know the concept about it. Something happens somewhere on the internet that triggers something else to happen. So the Webhooks API allows you to set up and register uh, triggers in your BIM 360 files, in your projects. So if somebody uploads a file, if somebody syncs with Central successfully, or you know cloud syncs with Central, if somebody deletes a file, you can use a Webhook to trigger an activity for something else to happen. So the example I always give is every time you sync, you could automatically send out a tweet that you synced your model. Don't know why you'd want to do that. Obviously, you'd probably want to web hook into something that's more internal and kicks off maybe some accounting process or something on your project management software. Uh, but the web hooks allows you to register and subscribe to activities that are happening inside of BIM 360 so you can trigger new things that, that happen from that. So, Kind of basic, but, but you can do some really exciting stuff with it. There's kind of the overall BIM 360 API, and that includes things like creating accounts and setting up people as um, you know, admins on projects or their use on projects, let you create projects, move files around. Uh, anything you can kind of do in BIM 360, the BIM 360 API kind of groups it up. Some of the nicer ones are the more recent ad additions to uh, BIM 360, your issues, um, your RFIs, and your checklist. So again, if I have these, if I need to edit them in bulk, if I need to download a bunch of them, if I need to check them all off at once, I can build my own application 
that will access all the RFI or all the checklist data on my BIM 360 project and do it through my tool as opposed to through, as opposed through the BIM 360 interface. So these are all hooks. These are all ways that we get in there, um, ways you can build your own tools on top of it. Uh, this is the viewer. This is what you people usually see when we talk about BIM 360. Uh, I don't have to use the BIM 360 website and I don't have to use BIM 360 storage to use a large model viewer. I can build my own application. I can save my files somewhere else. Uh, it's, it's a nice, fast interface and they figured out all the bugs uh, and you can do some tweaks to the UI and some customization on there as well. So a lot of the BIM 360 stuff you see, you've seen up here. The API essentially means I can take parts of it and I can tweak it and I can make it work better for me. <clears throat> what I really want to talk about tonight is design automation. Um, back in, I want to say it was February, uh, I can't remember when, uh, I went up to Autodesk headquarters uh, up in Boston and uh, I was able to spend a week at what I'm going to affectionately refer to as Nerd Camp. And it was essentially a week where a bunch of programmers and developers get together and we got to work with the design automation team and we started hammering out new ideas for the design automation for Revit. We got to work on little ideas um, and this is where a lot of this stuff comes from. So there is design automation for AutoCAD, there's design automation for Max, there's design automation for Inventor. I forgot all those softwares a long time ago so I just worked on Revit um, and Revit is the one that's most recent as well. You'll notice it's in beta, um, but the, the, the potential hopefully is here. So kind of as a baseline for design automation, you can build an application that is Windows or desktop based or it's web based. Now with that, your application and the files in the application have to be internet accessible. So I can't just have you know, a completely off the web uh, file. The design automation API calls from the web, it has to be able to see the web, I have to be able to upload my files to the web. What it essentially is, is a headless version of Revit. So it is a UI-less version of Revit sitting in the cloud that can grab files and I can make it do stuff. <clears throat> if you have a Revit application, if you have a third-party application that we've been talking about, that I talked about earlier, those are kind of the first things that people are migrating over into Forge. There's no UI, so you have to build a kind of a web-based UI. Um, but this is kind of the first step that people are going for. It's like, I've got this thing, it's running on my desktop, I want to run it in the cloud. This is what we are going to be doing with that. Um, and as I said, the UI is kind of through your application, either through your website or through the program you design itself. From a conceptual end, so we're going to offset some of our processor heavy tasks. Um, if the Revit API could do it, you can pretty much do it in design automation as well. Here's kind of the key. You don't need to own Revit to run this. You kind of need to own Revit to write the software so you know how Revit works obviously, but you can build an application on the web through the design automation API it's going to allow anybody, anywhere, to manipulate Revit files through your application without using Revit at all. Um, you absolutely need a Revit model, but what this starts to allow for, something that started flickering in my head, is it allows collaboration between team members without needing the design software. In my past life, uh, at a very specific firm, in fact, did a lot of work around attention. Did a lot of attention work. We had a guy who was just creepily knew how criminals thought. Um, and he was just great at, you know, keying up doors and figuring out what should plug into this and where should go here. Um, never wanted him in Revit ever, but he had a lot of information in his mind that we had to get into the model. So door schedules that were literally pages and pages long, we'd usually print out, he'd look at, he'd mark up, and we'd spit it back into Revit manually. This was one of the first things I thought about, and I think probably three or four people know exactly what I'm talking about, but um, design automation would have been an outstanding way for me to build an interface for him that simply exposes 
the door keying information, you know, only the parameters and only the data in the doors in my model that he needs to see through a web page. He just fills it out and it's done. It immediately injects that information into the model. So we're talking finishes, we're talking, you know, uh, schedules, room information, anything that somebody else on the design team needs to plug into, who you don't want to touch your model directly, you can quarantine pockets of that model to give to them through design automation. So that, that got me very, very excited. <clears throat> Some examples we had from NerdCamp. Um, and I, I, I'm not gonna give names because I don't know how proprietary, but I'm gonna tell you sort of what they did. Um, so the first one there was, this was a pretty neat one. Um, th these guys, um, they, they had the need to make sure families that were being used had the same parameters, the same shared parameters plugged in them all the time. And instead of sending the shared parameter file out and hoping your consultants then went and, yeah, I got, I added all that, we're good. They set up a website that already knew the shared parameters file, already knew the parameters it wanted. You would upload your RFA file to the website. They would think for a couple seconds and then you download that RFA file all ready with the parameters attached, all ready to go at the type level, at the instance level, everything set up exactly like they needed it set up. Kind of taking a couple steps further, they were talking about batches, so you just upload a bunch of family files at once, and then not only that, they could give you a form where you start pre-populating some of the parameters, because it could add the parameters and start filling them out as well. <clears throat> Another example that I thought was pretty cool, um, there was a, a uh, fellow from Ireland who was working on this. Um, he was a residential uh, contractor. They have, you know, kind of their uh, uh, base models, but there's always variations. You can get this porch, or you can get this bathroom, or you can add this, or you can add that. He had what he referred to as kind of his super model. So it was a Revit file with dozens and dozens of options and option sets in there like everything in this one file. And so people would chip, would select what they wanted, and then he would have to go into Revit, and this is my option primary, you know, accept primary, delete, primary, accept primary, delete. He was starting to build the interface where people would go and simply select the options they wanted on the website, and then design automation, the back end would know, okay, this is primary, collapse, this is primary, collapse, this is primary, collapse. Without actually having to open Revit at all, they were then given a customized, specific model selected from their own options. Uh, he had a long way to go, but he made a first couple of first really cool steps, and it was just really, really neat to see. <clears throat> um, this is what I was up there working on. Uh, our uh, CAD microsystems, we work with Autodesk directly on the Revit model checker. Um, so we were up there. We are currently working on trying to get the model checker online. So instead of having to open up Revit and to run a check, you can just open up a web page, point to your projects in BIM 360, point to your check, and then let it run for you. Uh, this would be able to expose things like scheduling, uh, automatic emailing of reports, just a lot of functionality that you can't get with Revit sitting on your desktop. Uh, there's one guy, uh, part of the team, he's been tweeting about this. I haven't seen much recently, but he found just some web tool that you just draw lines on. And so he took that and now he converts those lines over into walls in a model. And then he, there's this little picture of a couch you drag on to the picture, and then that couch is in your model as well. So literally a design layout application through a web interface that immediately creates a Revit file for you. So, some pretty wacky stuff that's going on. All right, so those are our examples, some things to watch out for. Um, it is definitely still in beta, so keep that in mind. They're gonna tell you 100 times, don't use this on production, don't use this on production, don't use this on production. Um, I would probably back that up, but definitely start thinking about how you want to start using this on production. Uh, we found the documentation to be spotty. If you do a Google search for something, you may get answers that are two years old, and the Forge API has been changing and, and updating so quickly version one is already outdated and version two is what you've got to make sure you are paying attention to. <clears throat> this is a big asterisk on the design automation. So currently it cannot support getting a local copy of a work shared model. 
You basically have to make a detached copy every time, run your design automation functionality on it, and then basically take it and kind of do a new save as central. Uh, this is their number one priority. They know this is something they need, need to tackle. Uh, but right now, this is probably the number one reason not to take it into production. Because every time you do something to your file, it's a whole new central model. And then you just got to start thinking about how your world is going to change forever. Crazy future thoughts. Um, I don't work for Autodesk. I don't know what Autodesk is thinking. This is just what was going on in my head as I was kind of working on this and playing with this and, you know, just nutty, nutty, nutty things. This is starting to take Revit out of the Revit file. You know, this is starting um, to show us a new way that data in our models is going to be organized and thought about. It's not going to be a single model database anymore. There are going to be portions of database floating around the web that all happen to talk to each other and that everybody can access the portions that they want to access. So I don't think design automation itself is going to be the final form, but I think the more we start using it and the more we start doing things with it, that is going to help dictate and narrate what the next phase is going to be like. I feel like I'm talking about Pokemon right now because um, they're all going to evolve and we're going, anyway, sorry. Um, yeah, your cloud-hosted Revel model ultimately does not be a single file. It's a database. It's going to be stored in tables. It's going to be more efficient. Uh, and then everybody's going to be able to grab it when they need to grab it. So with that, that was your uh, warning there. Quick summary, is everyone still awake? Forge is your web-based API. Design automation for Revit is a portion of the Forged API. It's going to open up your Revit models to non-Revit users. Hopefully you picked up something. Any quick questions? Otherwise, we can roll into the good presentation for the night. So the question was, if you are one of, if you got a web page and you want to manipulate a, a family file, um, does that family file have to live in BIM 360? It does not. You just, you, your, your model doesn't either. Um, you simply have to be able to put that in the web. Essentially, all this stuff runs in Amazon Web Services, so you've got to be able to get it through the web, through your, your dialogue up there. So yeah, it does not have to be on BIM 360. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the other question was, is there any limits kept on how much processing you can borrow? So right now, um, how they're talking about charging is going to be per processor minute. You hit 15 minutes, it's like one cloud credit. Um, currently, they will stop you after an hour of processing. So if your application just happens to loop or something and it hits an hour, it will just kill it. Um, but everything we've been running has been faster in the cloud than it is on our desktop. And that's, so the UI is gone and it doesn't have to wait for you to click and it just kind of rock and roll. Cool, thank you. Any other questions? All right, thanks All right. for your attention. Yeah. Nathan, you want to come up here? All right, well, hopefully that gave you all some, you got to get set up here. Hopefully that gave you all some insight into where Autodesk is going with their, um, you know, thinking of, of how they're going to, you're going to use their programs in the future. And it's, I think right now it's not going to be, it's going to be an and and not an or. But uh, watch for the applications that get developed. And with that, let's have a big round of applause for Nathan for coming out tonight. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, so my name is Nathan Blinn. I'm the director for advanced construction technologies at Eagle Construction, as well as the principal researcher for Architectonic. So it's our subsidiary company that we started to simply focus on construction technology services. Um, so my background is both academic and industry related. So did my graduate studies and got my PhD at the University of Florida where I taught for five years, um, specifically in this area on not only the technology itself, but everything from reality capture through BIM and focused my research on integration strategies and the process we all know too well um, that is not an easy one to navigate. So what I'm planning on talking about today is going to start to talk a little bit about Architectonic, just explain who we are so you understand my background and my current kind of lens that I'm looking at all this through. Um, talking about the BIM workforce, just a quick hit analysis, then into BIM 360, how I've used it in the past, how we're currently using it, and how that helps create our relationships. 
um, as well as a, an example that we used at Autodesk, that we presented at Autodesk University for an academic and professional partnership to start to create some of these ways of creating a connection with the future workforce. Um, and then some of the certification programs that I'm working on with an eye to the future. So what I'm hoping is a lot of ground to cover in 30 minutes. Uh, what I'm hoping is it just plants some seeds in your mind, gives you some things to think about as we all move on and try to advance our industry and what we do. Um, since we all clearly love what we do and love what we're talking about, hopefully this will start keep pushing us in a new direction. So with no further ado, um, Architectonic is essentially a construction technology services company. We've created the Tech Lab. We're over in West Broad Village. Um, what we focus on is the development, integration, training, and consulting for advanced technologies. So working with <coughs> BIM 360, Forge, trying to develop new platforms and interfaces that help make this data and information accessible, as well as moving into the residential space and bringing the residential space into the 21st century, uh, using, utilizing the full breadth of tools at your disposal through the Revit platform. So not just having a pretty model for the customer, but using the data effectively in the residential space, um, which I think we all know is lagging behind the commercial space, right? But there's a lot of great advantages there where the cycle time's shorter and you can apply faster. So that's what we're working on. Um, and we do service the AECO industry holistically. So Eagle is our primary, so we're a subs subsidiary of them. So we do, they're our primary client, but we do work with other engineers, architects, um, and builders kind of all over the country to try to help bring everybody with us um, as we try to improve the industry as a whole. So our primary, primary area of operation right now is in the building information modeling space, converting files, converting processes from the traditional CAD process into this space, and making sure that what we're doing is effective and sustainable for those companies. Um, as well as in-house laser scanning, drone mapping, GPS-driven surveying, um, and process development to help kind of take all of this information, which is all well and good, but it's only as good as it is as, as it can get to the field. So trying to make sure we bring it out to the field and put it in the hands of those who are really empowered when they have it. So now that you kind of have the lens that I'm looking at all of this through currently, let's talk a little bit about the BIM workforce. So we are all part of this workforce. We know that it's hard to find good talent, um, and that's not something that is necessarily a bad thing. It's just something we have to work on, right? So some of the information that came out from McGraw-Hill a number of years ago, I'm hoping they do their next round of data for the North America region. Um, they, the most recent one they put out was for Saudi Arabia. So I'll focus on North America here. Essentially what we've seen over the past number of years, we can all attest to it, is that adoption is increasing across all markets, all areas of AEC. Um, and we've seen that pretty steady. The data is pretty clear on that. When we come over to the implementation levels, we're seeing a transition. When you look over to the 2014 data, which was realized and exceeded, you saw a transition from companies that said they use BIM and used it a little bit, to now if you say you use BIM, generally you use it pretty heavily, um, which is just a shift in an understanding in the software and what it can do for you. So this is a pretty, a pretty reasonable trend that I think we've all seen, right? Once your company starts to adopt this, you start to push into it fairly heavily. Um, as owners require it, and so on and so forth. The next side of it is that it doesn't seem to really matter whether it's an architect, an engineer, a contractor, or an owner. We're seeing a similar uptick in adoption across all the research that we've done, all the studies that are done, that adoption is happening. And it's happening globally, not just in the United States, which is a good sign. The part I want to talk about is this part, which is the workforce itself. So they did a study to look at the years of experience that people have using BIM, and from 2009 to 2012, you saw a huge shift, which you'd kind of expect, and when you first look at the data, no, they didn't survey the same people, because that would be misleading, um, but their study that they did basically saw that in 2009, the majority of people had only been using BIM for about two years, right? Which makes sense, because maybe just getting into it. At, in 2012, you had a lot higher usage, so people have been using it for a lot longer. But what you didn't see on the other side was a backfill of people in the beginner stage. So people who identified themselves as beginners versus experts, you saw an inversion in what existed. So in 2012, you had, a, you had more experts and advanced users, but it wasn't being backfilled by additional beginners coming into the industry. And I think we've all started to see that. I, I'm sure I have shared experiences, and I hope we get to talk about it where as we all start to get better at it, it's harder to find that new talent coming in, right? And that's what this is indicating, is that the people who got in on the train early stuck with it and are staying there, but we're not backfilling with new people to help 
fill the need that we have within the industry. So as I move through the next couple parts of the presentation, um, I want you to kind of think about a handful of things. So think about how a focus on academic collaboration, how we can partner with academic institutions of all kinds to start identifying missing skill sets, start looking at emerging trends, identifying how we can start to build that workforce up. Um, think about some of the successful strategies you've found for not only finding new people, but training them, certifying them, getting them up to speed, what's worked for you. Um, hopefully we'll be able to have a good conversation about that. As well as what you and your organization perceive the importance of developing the workforce in the BIM and VDC space, right? We all love what we do, but what's the importance of inspiring others to be just as excited about it as we are? Um, and then an important one that I've come across recently is how do you feel about the difference between developing new talent or finding talent that already exists? What do you see there? Because that helps drive where you want to put your efforts into developing the workforce. So let's keep that in mind as we jump through the rest of this. So BIM 360, we all know it now. Uh, it's got come a long way in the past four years, I think. They've made quite a few changes. So the BIM 360 platforms as they exist today, um, currently with Eagle and through the tech platform, we're using BIM 360 docs, so laying that foundation to create that conversion into the data space that then we can lay the rest of the pieces of BIM 360 on top of. The plan over the next handful of months, years, so on and so forth, is to bring in plan, build, and layout to start not only being able to be more effective in planning our projects and communities, but to be able to use that information more effectively, get that information in the hands of the subcontractors and the people out in the field. And that's the transition we have started at this point. The exciting thing is that I'm glad I was here for the Forge conversation. That's the next step that we're moving into. So once we lay the foundation, how can we make that information easier for people to get through through the poor Forge platform, right? Of course, after Forge, moving into the academic partnership side. Where I found success using BIM 360 with the academic partnership side is of course with BIM 360 docs and then on the design side, where you can all be in models at the same time. You can work with students, educators, other people remotely and be able to create that unified experience using the BIM 360 platform. And the great thing about this is that all academic institutions have the opportunity to get all of this software for free for their students. So there's no barrier to entry for academic institutions. It just takes one person to reach out to Autodesk and create that relationship. Um, I think we all know Autodesk is pretty good about giving their software away to students for free um, so that we all use it later, right? So definitely something to think about as we move forward. Those are the things we've used and had success with, and I'll give you some examples as we move forward. So currently on the residential side with BIM 360, uh, we have a number of projects set up. Um, so I had a number of ideas running through my head with the Forge platform and what I'm going to do to make setting all this up easier as we move forward. Uh, but the way we basically move through it all is currently where we are is our field team has access to this information. We're starting to get them used to it so that we can make the conversion from our current back office platform into this space. So to help them utilize this information to not only visualize the information, the accurate information that wasn't printed two months ago, uh, but also to understand how they can send feedback mark things up, send it back, and have that constant communication with the office as customizations happen. We're loading in not only our models themselves, but also data related to how it sits on the site. So using our laser scanning and reality capture tied with our GPS-driven surveying to actually site the homes effectively so that we can look at the topography of the site and make effective decisions and don't not just leave it up to the guys in the field. Allow them to have good conversations with everybody and make effective data-driven decisions utilizing this information all the way from the very beginning when we're designing a new project and trying to figure out what we can fit effectively on the site out to when it's actually in the field and we have to set those final elevations. So that's some of what we're using it for. The main things that BIM 360 has done for us both commercially and academically is imp improved our ability to not only integrate and start working with back, back office software, um, but to provide access to subcontractors, field team members in a more real-time manner while being flexible. Uh, so, of course, with the customizations we do, you have to be able to be flexible. It's not something that's written in stone. And then to develop new, th new solutions that I'm going to be able to feed in, as well as then that collaboration piece is key. So collaborate not only with subcontractors in our team, but also with academic institutions as we move forward. So talking about that collaboration, how we dive into that with these academic institutions currently to help kind of bolster that workforce and inspire a new generation of 
BIM people is, of course, where every single one of us, our mind would go immediately is internships, right? So we start there, we bring them in. We've partnered with a number of different in institutions to start bringing in interns. Um, I have two in my office now, and we have four others throughout the company who know how to use the software and help bring everybody else along with them while they're there for the summer. Looking at also certified internships, so reaching out to those institutions you have a relation with or a relationship with or that you create to do long term, so more placements, right? They spend eight months there. They get college credit for it. It becomes more of a learning opportunity that you're not just exposing them to your company but to career opportunities that they might otherwise not have known about, right? The third thing is sponsorships. So working with higher education institutions conducting research in this space. So we actually sponsor students and work with them on their research to help provide industry backup to what they're doing and help them create industry-driven hypotheses that they can move their research through and help drive the industry and create contributions. Um, it's a really interesting way to create that partnership and be exposed to those emerging trends. So definitely something to think about. All of this I would consider kind of connected learning, right? So what we're doing here today, all of those different pieces. I have a handful of institutions that I've worked with or have colleagues at um, that I know do this kind of stuff fairly regularly. If you reach out to somebody on the academic side and tell them you want to collaborate and create and, and help them create an exercise for a student, I'm pretty much guaranteed you won't have any resistance, right? They love having people from industry come in and help work on how to create an experience for students, how to expose them to new career opportunities. So definitely something to think about how we can be a continuing part of this process, not just academic institutions, but also continuing education. How can we help develop it, help push things forward um, so that the needle's always moving in this direction. So a quote that I love on experiential learning, um, I won't read the quote to you, but essentially John Dewey, he's a famous educator and psychologist. What he kind of proposed, which I found to be extremely true, is that instead of giving some, somebody something to learn, give them something to do that makes them think. So don't tell them how to do it, just give them something to think about, and they'll learn on their own. And that's especially with what we do, true, right? I think Autodesk does it to us quite a bit. Here's an API, have fun, right? So we have to come up with how we do it, and it's extremely effective. And so think about that in how you work with these academic institutions and budding professionals or technical schools to help bring people along. The experiential learning not only helps build practical appreciation for the concepts that they're learning and give them a hands-on experience and exposure to career opportunities, but on the professional side, it creates a no-risk environment for testing. So what are those new ideas that you can't test on a live project and you probably don't have time for just to do on your own? This is a good way for you to do that, right? Have students help you go through that process. Test may be a slightly different workflow, see how efficient it is. So it's kind of an exciting way to move through it. And this exact thing is something that we did for Autodesk University two years ago, is we created what we're calling a collaborative coordination exercise. What we did was we partnered with a professional, so this is while I was still at the University of Florida, we partnered with a professional entity to develop a project to provide an opportunity for students to get hands-on VDC management experience, for a, as well as give the industry partners the opportunity to move into BIM 360 and test some things that they couldn't test on a live project a few different work workflows. So I'm gonna kind of move through the exercise fairly quickly. Essentially what we did was it was in four stages. First stage, we worked with the industry partner to identify mutually beneficial goals. What do our students need to learn? What does the industry partner wanna test, right? Something we all could probably think of like three things we'd like to test but just can't do on a live project. How could we have students or academic researchers help us, right? Once we think about all that and we prepare BIM 360 and get that all up and running, we moved in and kicked the project off and had a full project kickoff meeting. The project we decided to do was a coordination project. So we took a big hotel job that they had just finished coordination on, they thought they could have done some things a little bit different, and we presented it to the students and gave them the live coordination models. Put them in BIM 360, assigned their roles, did an actual kickoff meeting just like any other project, and then prepared them for stage two, which was a three-hour coordination meeting. So we actually did a live coordination meeting, had them in what was at the time BIM 360 team uh, before it became design, had them in there actually live updating the model and making the changes to coordinate all of the trades. So each of them was assigned a different trade and they had to live coordinate and have these discussions with the contractor as the kind of general contractor. The academics were the owners, so making sure they met all those requirements, and then had them walk through this experience threw a couple wrinkles in, and we took the actually fully coordinated models and then broke them 
so we could control what they were gonna run into a little bit, um, and so that our industry partner could test those handful of things that they wanted to try out a little bit in a more controlled environment. Um, as you can imagine, taking a full model like that and giving it to a group of 20 to 30 master's students, the model could get messed up pretty quick. So we wanted to control where things came from and help them learn why you have to be so careful when you're in these models and authoring those tools. So this is actually how we had it set up on the day of coordination. Every single one of the students was at their computer terminal, logged in to the live model, logged into what was blue at the time, it's now coordinate, um, and then we had it up in the front and live streamed in our industry partner from a different state to do the coordination activity and run through it all. Went through three iterations of that, um, and the students, they actually enjoyed themselves. I was a little worried that they were gonna get kind of sick of it after the first round, um, but they actually ended up, class went a little bit long because they had more questions and more questions and more questions. Um, but then the great part was at the end, we came back the next course, the next class, and had the industry partner explain to them how the actual coordination process went. How'd that all go? And exposed a lot of them to some career opportunities and to some things they hadn't thought about. Right? Some of them thought, oh, well, we're learning how to model, that's great, but I don't wanna do that forever, so what does that mean? So they got to talk to a superintendent, they got to talk to a project manager, the VDC director, and understand the implications of what they're learning for the industry, so that there's more than just being a modeler, right? There's a lot more to it, and we need a lot more than that. So that's just one example of how a partnership activity could go. Um, went really well, we were really pleased with it, and they still do it to this day, um, just with different projects each year to help the students learn. So the next part about how we can help build the workforce is of course through our certification and education programs, um, but there's a lot to think about there. Um, I know some of you here have worked on the BIM-R project, you probably have sim, uh, the CM-BIM certifications, of course, certified professional, certified users, all of those different things, right? The great thing about all of these is it provides an opportunity and a platform to learn and become specialized in something, right? It gives the opportunity to really kind of at least start to understand the playing field that we're working with as professionals come in and we try to evaluate their skills before we bring them on board or as we decide how we're going to train them. The one thing that the current certification platform doesn't have is some sort of universal language, right? If you're an engineer, you, you know, a PE after your name. You go through school, you have a PhD. You finish as an architect, you get your license. But in the BIM and VDC space, there's no universal understanding of what it means to be a BIM professional, right? There, there's no certification, there's no way to really roll it all through. These are all that really great step towards that. Some of the things that are being worked on right now so I'm working actually on a team with Autodesk to do some skill tree development and start the process of creating some of these things. So how do we understand what skills are needed as a BIM professional, what skills are needed at what level of your career, and how can we support the building of those skills in an effective way? So what we're working through is looking at the different levels, whether you're at a basic level, an intermediate level, or an advanced level, where that puts you in your career, what roles tie to that, and what skills you should be expected to have at those levels. Now that includes non-software specific skills, so right now we're not talking about software, we're talking about just general skills in that space. Um, and then we'll be able to convert that into actual training programs, provide resources, and start to lay the foundation for creating kind of a more universal understanding of what it means to be a VDC or a BIM professional in today's world. So we're at that, those first stages in this project. Um, it's going pretty well, but as you can imagine, there's a lot of data to go through as we're going through this. So people from all over the country are kind of talking through this, and there's hundreds of pages of things that we're talking about, so it takes some time. The next group that I'm working with is the Academic Interoperability Coalition. They're focusing more on the education side of things, right? So not so much the technical skills side, but the education side. So we all know that accreditation is very important for schools, both architecture, construction, engineering. So what the AIC has done is basically taken all those accreditation procedures, everything that's currently out there, and tried to start to understand how it currently speaks to the necessity for some of this VDC knowledge within the workforce. So they've gone through a really extensive study to create this body of knowledge framework that then we can start to build new accreditation standards on top of. So instead of just saying we should require BIM in construction education, okay, but what does that mean? Or what does it mean to require that? What skills should a project manager with a construction degree have? What skills should an architect have when they come out of architecture school? 
you know, all, all of those things are now being able to be formalized so that they can be presented as a united front to say, the accreditation needs to include these things in its next iteration. So I can definitely pass some of this information along. It's a very interesting study, if you ever get a hankering to do some reading. Um, but it, it's really interesting to start thinking about what you do every day and how those skills have developed over your career and what it meant at each stage of your career to have certain skills, right? It seems simple, but then when you think about how do you then take that and apply it to building the workforce at the front end and creating accreditation standards and training standards, it, it's kind of interesting to think about. So that's what we've started to do. So all of these things that I've talked about kind of lead to, to one big thing, which is the next generation needs to be trained and brought up appropriately in this new space. So BIM and VDC is still realistically completely new in the world of AECO, right? When you look at the lifespan of the industry as a whole, what we all do is still relatively new. Jobs that exist today did not exist 10 years ago. Um, and so it's an exciting time to be in our position, but it also gives us a lot to think about, I think. So I'm gonna end with this to then move on to our conversation and start to have a discussion about some of the, the seeds that hopefully I've planted, is, is why does, why is it important to think about this? Why, why is it important to think about education, right? We all have a million things to do. Why is it important to think about how these things tie together? So I urge you to think about these things as you're going through your next week or so, kind of think about these things as you're doing your job. Firstly, what do you see the future of our industry being? In an ideal world, what do you think we could be in five, 10, 20 years, right? What does that mean to you? The second question that builds on that is, where do you think the skills, passion, inspiration, and the future that you're hoping, where does all of that come from? Right? So hopefully you're, you want to be a part of it, you, you, your colleagues are going to be a part of it, but then how do we build the back end to make that a reality? Next, and I would argue probably most importantly, is how can you be somebody who inspires the new generation to come into the workforce and find careers in a space that we all know and love, but that really is kind of a found area, right? I think all of us probably have a very unique story for how we got to where we are. So how do we inspire kids coming out of high school? going into college to think about a career at this, not as something that they find while they're there, but something that they knew about before they got there and something that they started pursuing from the very beginning. And then lastly, you know, everything that we do, especially as VDC professionals, creates opportunities for ourselves and our colleagues, but it creates opportunities for future professionals as well. So some of what we do, we're creating jobs that didn't exist years ago. There will be jobs that we find in five years that didn't exist now as we create new things in the industry and keep pressing forward. Um, I have a student right now who's working part-time who goes to VCU who's doing my laser scanning and GPS work. So when he came in and started talking to me about his interests, he didn't think that that was even a possibility. We brought him in, we trained him, and now he's doing something that never would have thought of eight months ago. So everything that you do has that continuing impact, so how can you be a part of it? How can we continue to push it forward? And then the last thing that I tell my, my employees every day, or at least a couple times a week, is all we can try to do is be better today than we were yesterday and be better tomorrow than we were today. If we do that, eventually, everything we're talking about and all the exciting ideas we all have can come to fruition, and hopefully it'll, it'll do that through a lot of our efforts. So love to answer questions, have a conversation. Thank you all for letting me speak with you today. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course. Fair enough. So the question was, you know, BIM is a process, not just a, a single tool. So how do we address the, the kind of fear or notion that that could in somehow limit people's kind of creative nature and the ability to move beyond what that tool can do? And it's a great question, and it's one I get quite a bit, especially when we start talking about this, right? So BIM is a process. It's, 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 a, it's a tool. It's not a solution, right? It's part of the solution to the problem. 
And so the way I always address that and the way that we're talking about it in a lot of these things is that you're looking at the process of how does it impact the ability to manage and on the construction side specifically, which is where my focus is, how do you use these tools to be a better manager, to better control projects? And now that we have the ability, how can you make the tools better to do what we need to do to be more efficient and better? Same thing on the architecture side, right? How do we take our creative design and then use the tools to make it easier for everybody else to understand and more efficient to build so that that can happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So the question, I guess, is how do we address the changing demographics and the need for ever more housing, buildings, all those things at a breakneck speed, right? Right. How, how are we being better, right? How can we be better? And I think that the answer to that is that, of course, these tools and what we all know and love can't solve those problems on its own, right? It's part of the solution. And so part of that becomes from the other side of that educational component, which is what else is being taught that this all supplements. And that's the important thing. Mm -hmm. So it has to make a dramatic shift in what way? So I think all of these tools, so the question is how can these tools help us get kind of to the places that we're expected to get to, which are far reaching from where we are in a lot of cases, right? And I think the tools enable that in that you can create additional efficiencies in the things that should be, that are repetitive and can be automated to allow the human aspect, the problems that we have to solve as you know, humans, we can focus on that and not so much the repetitive nature. So I guess a, an easy example I can use is you know, on the drafting that we're doing with Eagle, we have a lot of design options, right? A lot of standard things that you want this bathroom, this bedroom, and it's kind of a watered down example of what you're asking, but I think it might get the point across. All of those things are pretty standard, right? Which one do you want? So what we've done with the software is we've made that a button click through design options to finish it, so now we can provide to the homeowner the customizations that they want in a better way, in a more efficient way, and give them the opportunity to get the home they want. So it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a different example, but it allows us to take the monotonous work that just needs to get done and put through and move that aside to allow us to get to the important things that we're trying to solve. And not everything can obviously be automated, but the things that can, now we can focus on the important stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So automation and construction, especially, it's, it's lagging behind in this country as opposed to some other markets. Um, but the automation component, the pre-manufactured component, the ability to kind of panelize structures and do those sorts of things is 100% being thought about. Um, there is some resistance um, across the board, as you can imagine, from people thinking, well, it gets too boxy or too square. But with a little bit of creative thought, it can be done correctly. So the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, so the new basketball arena that they finished a number of years ago, that was done using Dassault systems, so it didn't use Revit, but they used Dassault systems. And essentially, that whole facade was all pre-manufactured components drawn out of that system that were all freeform and driven by architectural design concepts. And then it was able to be panelized and packaged down and brought out so they could do something that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to afford to do, but now they can because they can make 
the most of that manufacturing component. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I think so. Um, I think the you know the acceleration of the process as the tools become easier to use, we're able to create interfaces that allow people to access the information and data they need to solve that problem without the back end that we all know can be very complicated. I think we'll be able to start to see it move forward a lot more efficiently, um, kind of break down the barrier to entry to allow people to start accessing some of this information without kind of the scary, here's everything, take the pieces you want, right? How can we trim it down and make it easier for people to use? It's a great question. So the question was, you know, doing a lot to try to help people who want to go into the VDC space understand what it means and what the opportunities are, but how are we helping those who don't necessarily want to be in that space but have other career opportunities that will still be impacted? What are we doing to help them understand that? Um, and it's a great question because it's one of the things I got the most um, at the University of Florida was they'd go to go into the BIM course and say, I don't really want to take this course. I don't plan on modeling ever, so I don't know why I need to be here. And so part of it is an education by the professors in those other courses that everything that is happening in construction will be impacted by this data. It will be impacted in some way, right? So they have to understand how it impacts them. So we did a lot of coursework design and a lot of universities and different organizations are starting to find ways to bring this information into those other courses. So estimating is a great example. So developed a course flow where you do the hand takeoffs because you have to know how to do that. Then you do it the traditional way with you know, an on-screen takeoff or something like that, and then you do it a third time using the modeling software, where they're not actually creating the model, they're pulling the data from the model. So by, that's a good way of integrating it into that space where they can see, okay, just because you don't want to touch the model doesn't mean you can't pull data from it and it can't be useful. Um, and to help expose students to that so when they get out into the industry, they know what to ask for, right? So they can ask that question. Hey, do we have a schedule in Revit for this information that I could get imported in, you know, so they know what to ask for. Generally, once you go through one or two exercises and the courses start to show the other side of Revit, which is not just modeling, right, it's the data, students really start to realize that was a lot easier. I didn't have to count doors with a highlighter. I like that. How, how, can, we, how can we use that more? And so it's a little bit of, it's, it's a holistic look at the education process to help kind of bring it up to speed with what we all do every day, which is use data effectively. Um, so it's not just about how do you hand take something off or hand write a schedule, it's how do we use this data to make that part of your job more effective. Good question. All right. well, Nathan, thank, thank, thank you, you very much. And I, and I just want to add that, that uh, he had a, he had, Nathan hit on a lot of different things, but it's about inspiring people to get, you know, come into the industry and, and how do they understand what we're doing. I think this is a really a good forum for it, is that, that this group of people, you wouldn't, you know, the, the, the advances you're making in your individual businesses and, and the attention you're giving to this just by being here tonight, I think, is, is a great way to get you know, find people that want to get in the industry that can come talk to you about what, what your job is. So I think it's, it's up to all of us to get people into the industry as well as the academic uh, world. And, and you hit something near and dear to me, which is prefabrication. And I would say that it's, it's not only happening, but it's happening, you probably have a lot of examples. Well, I, 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 would, I would say that, 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 that yeah, you're, you're, you're right. I'm, I don't, wouldn't argue, argue your point. But I would just say that in the United States, we have a lot of different jurisdictions. We have a lot of different pla places that require things. Every organization is different. If you go to a place like Singapore, Singapore the government has required BIM modeling for that, that you have to get it to get do a permit. And then um, they've not only done that, they've provided all the content for you to model with. So that the industry standard is, is thou shall prefabricate. They require prefabrication models. So 
if you take these vacuum environments where they are requiring that the design information be used for fabrication, you see these efficiencies, and we're, and, and we're going to get schooled on this. I, I, I really believe that, that they're, they're going to lead the way, and we're going to be like, what are they doing over there? Because we're just really managing documents right now is really what's happening. We're not really interrogating the data like we should, and, and that's the idea behind BIM 360 is that there you can interrogate that data really, really quickly and ask those questions about how much energy will it use. Yes, BIMS. Sure. Perhaps. Yeah. I I I don't I don't I don't know if I I, I would argue that, but I I would say that 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 I, I agree with you. That it's a process, and and you. It, it helps a lot to have a computer, but you don't need a computer with it, but it's a mindset, and I think that's what we're, we're all trying to do. So anyway, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, we do, we'll be seeing you again in two more months, and uh, thanks for your support of the group.